From magic mirrors that sash you while answering questions to crystal balls that let you stalk your long-distance friends, glass has a myriad of magical uses in a world of fantasy. But how do you integrate it into your world? Should it be a magical component, a whole magic system, or maybe just a window to the soul? That is what I want to talk about today. Glass in fantasy. Welcome to another episode of Just In Time Worlds with your host, Marie Mullaney. If you like what I do here, please do consider joining the channel for these cool perks or giving this video a super thanks if you find particular value in it. If you want to get something back for your support, check out my epic fantasy series, The Sangwheel Chronicles, available for sale at multiple online bookstores. Okay, enough of that. Let's crack on. First, let's talk about what glass actually is. Glass is a pretty weird substance. It is an amorphous solid, which means that its anatomic structure is different from that of crystalline materials. In crystalline materials, atoms are arranged in a regular repeating pattern or lattice, while in amorphous materials like glass, atoms are arranged more randomly. The primary component of most glass is silica, which consists of silicone and oxygen atoms. In glass, the silicone atoms are bonded to four oxygen atoms, forming a tetrahedral structure. However, unlike in crystalline materials like quartz, these tetrahedra are not arranged in a well-ordered repeating pattern. Instead, they are connected in this random, disordered way, almost like the atoms were playing musical chairs and, you know, the last one got stuck without a chair. This amorphous structure gives glass its transparency, as the lack of long-range order in the atomic arrangement prevents the scattering of light. It also contributes to the brittleness of glass, as the absence of a repeating lattice structure means that there are no preferred planes for the atoms to move along and to accommodate stress. So, this means glass is more prone to fracture. The random atomic arrangement also makes glass a good thermal insulator and provides it with excellent chemical resistance. Okay, so that's what glass is, and it's a pretty special material. But how is it formed? First, let's talk about all-natural, free-range glass. There are two types of glass here. Obsidian is formed when felsic, that's high silica content, lava, erupts from a volcano and cools very quickly upon contact with the air or water. The rapid cooling inhibits the formation of a crystalline structure, trapping the atoms in a disordered arrangement, similar to the atomic structure of glass. Hence why I say, it's like musical chairs. If it happens so fast that you don't have time to order yourself, you end up with glass. Obsidian is a material that is hard, brittle, and typically smooth with a glassy texture. Obsidian is normally black in color, due to the presence of minute impurities such as iron and magnesium within its composition. But these, imp these impurities absorb light rather than allowing it to pass through, which gives obsidian its dark appearance. However, it can also display other colors depending on the specific impurities and conditions during formation in the lava flow. Occasionally, obsidian may have a metallic sheen or exhibit patterns like snowflake obsidian, which has white snowflake-like inclusions of crystabolite, a crystalline form of silica. So if you want obsidian glass that isn't black, just add different impurities in your world building close to your volcanoes, and you can have all colors of the rainbow. Obsidian has been used by various cultures throughout history for making sharp-edged tools and weapons, as well as decorative and ceremonial objects due to its ability to fracture into pieces with very sharp edges. And I spoke about obsidian and its use, especially in the bead making of the 
era-defined videos of the early Stone Age period. It's important to note that obsidian is mostly worked cold, and we'll talk more about cold working versus hot working a little later. But first, let's talk about the other natural glass, tektites. The formation of tektites occurs when a meteorite strikes the Earth with immense force, generating extremely high temperatures and pressures upon impact. This causes the surrounding terrestrial material, mainly rocks and soil obviously, to melt and be ejected into the atmosphere. The molten material then cools rapidly as it travels through the air, solidifying into glassy objects before falling back to the earth. Due to the high speed formation and cooling, tektites have an amorphous structure like glass. Tektites come in a variety of shapes, sizes, and colors. They can be spherical, teardrop shape, or irregularly shaped, and their sizes range from a few millimeters to several centimeters in diameter. The color of tektites varies depending on their composition, but like obsidian, they are typically black or dark brown or greenish. Their surface can be smooth or textured, sometimes exhibiting grooves, pits, or sculpted features that result from the aerodynamic forces experienced during their flight through the atmosphere. Tektites are found in several regions around the world, known as strewn fields, because glass is strewn there, I guess. Where, meteorites, where meteorite impacts have occurred in the past. Some well-known tektite types include Molda, Moldavites, found mainly in the Czech Republic, Australites, found in Australia, and Indushinites, found in Southeast Asia. In a fantasy world, you could use tektite glass as special glass components tied to your magic system. You could call it something like star glass, the gift of the sky, or some name like that to give it a real fantasy feeling. It could also feed into your culture's religious elements, where the priests claim this glass carries the will of the gods or other such statements. So we can see that glass does occur naturally, but we also make glass. So let's talk about what that process involves. Glass is manufactured through a process that involves melting a mixture of raw materials, primarily silica, and then cooling and shaping the molten material into the desired form. The appearance, properties, and quality of the glass can be influenced by the choice of raw materials, as well as the manufacturing process itself, which we'll talk more about when we discuss the history of glass manufacturing. The main raw materials used in glass production are silica, usually obtained from sand, and it is the primary component, making up around 70 to 75% of the final composition. Then soda ash plays a large role in the manufacture of glass because when added to silica, it lowers the melting point required of glass making glass easier to form, and this is likely how they discovered to make glass during the Bronze Ages as a byproduct of all the smelting that they were doing on the ground. Limestone can be added to glass to improve durability and chemical stability of glass. It typically makes up around 5-10% to 10 of the glass composition. And aluminia is often added in small amounts to increase the hardiness and chemical resistance of glass. But this isn't the only thing you can add. You can add a variety of materials to glass mixtures to modify its properties, appearance, or color. For example, you can add metal oxides to produce colored glass. So iron will tinge a glass green. Cobalt will make blue glass, manganese will produce a purple glass, and so on. Adding materials like boron, barium, or lead can change the refractive index, thermal expansion, or other properties of glass. So, to create glass, the raw materials are just mixed together and then heated at high temperatures, typically between 1700 and 2000 degrees Celsius. 
For my American viewers, that's 3,100 to 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit. And once the glass components have melted together, they form a viscous liquid. The molten glass can then be shaped using a variety of techniques that we'll talk about shortly. And after they're shaped, the glass is slowly cooled in a controlled manner to prevent the formation of internal stresses that could cause it to crack or break. This process is called annealing. And it involves cooling the glass gradually in a special furnace or layer which allows the material to achieve a uniform appearance and structure. Once the glass has cooled and solidified, it can be cut, polished, or further processed using cold working techniques as needed for its intended application. You might think that clear glass is a no-brainer, but back in ancient and medieval times, it was actually the holy grail of glassmaking. This was because of impurities in the components, combined with the high temperatures you need for silica to melt. Now, soda ash, as I said, lowers the temperature required for glass. But if you add too much, you end up with colored glass because of the soda ash. Hence, it was enormously expensive and there was a great deal of skill required for the making of clear glass back in the day. So... Thumbs up if you enjoyed that discussion of what glass is, and let's talk about working glass. Glass working has been with us for ages, probably going all the way back to the Neolithic, maybe even the Paleolithic. Our ancestors used various polishing and shaping techniques to make glass beads from obsidian. We've found obsidian beads and obsidian-edged weapons dating back thousands of years. And once our ancestors mastered fire sufficiently hot to work glass, the bead-making business really took off. So what are these hot working techniques? Core forming was one of the earliest. So what happens with core forming is the glassmaker shapes a vessel around a core and winds a colored trail of hot glass around it, letting the glass cool to form bottles. These early vessels were mostly flasks for perfumed oils. So yeah, you can have perfume in a glass bottle going back to the Bronze Age and not bat an eyelid. But what really changed the game was glass blowing. This technique involves inflating molten glass by blowing air into a tube or pipe. It's like balloon animals, except hotter and way more breakable. From simple drinking glasses to intricate sculptures, glass blowing has been used for centuries to create stunning works of art. If you were blowing glass, you would gather molten glass onto the end of a blowpipe. You'd shape it by blowing into it with a pipe and then you'd manipulate it with various tools like tweezers and paddles. You could add color with colored glass or enamels and then you let the piece cool in an annealing oven to prevent it cracking. And that's it. Sounds simple, right? It's way harder than it looks. Glass molds can also be used for even more intricate designs and for designs produced at fair massive quantities. A mold can be carved out of wood or made out of ceramics. Then, instead of blowing the glass free, you gather the molten glass onto your blowpipe and then blow it into the mold and then carefully remove the mold once the glass is cooled and hardened. I use this technique of glass molds in my world. It is how my sewer charms are produced en masse. And sewer charms in my world are kind of like a prayer bead. So it's, very, so it's a very important part of one of my religions. So thumbs up if you enjoyed that discussion of working with glass. And let's take a look at some of the notable events in the history of glass. We already spoke about glass in the Bronze Age, but I should mention here that we actually have found a cuneiform glass manual that has survived from that era with written instructions on how to create glass. 
also contained within this manual is instructions on keeping the recipe secret, which tells us that glass was seen as a rare and precious item and the manufacturing thereof was treated with great care. But that was just making glass. As I said, it was glass blowing that changed the glass game forever. And we have the Romans to thank for that. Romans had a passion for glass and their hunger for the material eventually led them to the process of glass blowing, taking glass from small time to factory scale. The ancient Roman glass industry was divided into two categories, glass making and glass working. Roman glass making workshops, which have been found throughout the Roman Empire as well as the city of Rome itself, were usually situated near places where the raw materials for glass were available. I mean, that just makes sense. You don't want to cart the stuff around the country. Roman glass trade items have been found in China, proving that the two empires traded silk and glass back and forth, going all the way back to the classical time period, which is just awesome. When the Roman Empire fell, glassmaking in Europe took a hit, until eventually Venice and the Middle Ages. In Venice, they had this island called Murano, which is basically like Hotel California. You could check in, but you could never leave. The origins of Venetian glassmaking can be traced back to the 9th or 10th century, but it was during the 13th century that the industry really began to flourish with glassmaking developing and refining techniques that would become synonymous with Venetian glasses and style. In 1291, the Venetian government ordered all glassmakers to move their furnaces to the island of Murano, which is located in the Venetian lagoon, just north of the city of Venice. This decision was made for two primary reasons. First, it was an attempt to mitigate the risk of fires in the densely populated city, as glassmaking involved working with high temperatures and open flames. Secondly, it allowed the government to better control and protect the secrets of glassmaking, which was an important source of income and prestige for Venice, so of course they protected it. Murano became the center of the Venetian glassmaking industry, and the glass produced there was known for its exceptional quality and craftsmanship. Venetian glassmakers were renowned for their skill in creating delicate, intricate, and colorful works of art, and for their work with mirrors. Venetian glass was highly sought after throughout Europe and beyond, and the skills of Murano's glassmakers were passed down through the generation. The secrets of the trade were closely guarded, and glassmakers were forbidden by law from leaving the island to prevent the spread of their knowledge and techniques. So in your world, if you've got a super secret glass trade and a handy dandy island, you can make the Isle of Glass have a whole new meaning with a population permanently trapped on it, all of them going into glassmaking one after the other. This is also a great opportunity for industrial espionage right here. Somebody needs to steal onto the island and convince a glassmaker to hand over the, uh, hand over the secrets, or somebody needs to convince a glassmaker to defect. This probably happened to a greater or lesser extent in Europe. In the 17th century, King Louis XIV's finance minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, sought to establish a French mirror industry that would rival and ultimately surpass the Venetians. In 1665, he founded the Manufacture Royale de Glace, Royal Glass Factory, in saint Gobain which would later become the St. Gaban Company, one of the world's largest manufacturers of building materials. The French government lured skilled Venetian glassmakers to France with a promise of high wages and protection from Venice in order to learn and adapt their techniques. So, break out from Rono Island, the story is on. 
The French mirror makers succeeded in developing their own versions of the Venetian mirror making process and the production of the mirrors for the Hall of Mirrors in the Palace of Versailles marked a major milestone in the growth of the French glass industry. The large, high-quality mirrors produced for the hall were a testament to the skill and expertise of French glassmakers, and they contributed to the decline of the Venetian monopoly on mirror production specifically. The Hall of Mirrors in Versailles remains an incredible site, and it is where the Treaty of World War I was signed. So it remains also a landmark for cultural reasons. While we're talking history of specific glass objects, let's take a brief detour to talk about reading stones and eyeglasses. Reading stones are simple magnifying devices that consist of a piece of polished convex shaped glass or crystal that magnifies the text underneath, underneath it when placed directly on top of the reading material. The convex shape of the glass bends light rays and focuses them, making the text appear larger and easier to read. The concept of the reading stone can be traced back to the ancient world, but they were more commonly used during the Middle Ages, particularly in Europe. The exact date of the invention is not known for certain but their use is attributed to the English philosopher and scientist Roger Bacon, 1219 to 1292. He described their magnifying properties in writing. However, similar ideas about the magnifying properties of lenses were also explored by Arab scholars such as Alazen ibn al-Haytham in the 11th century. So there and thereabouts in that time period is when reading stones were probably at their most popular. They were especially useful during the time when books were rare, expensive, and often written in small, difficult-to-read scripts. Monks and scholars frequently used reading stones to read and copy manuscripts. So if you have a world that is pre-printing press, it is entirely possible that people use reading stones to work with those book materials and they hold their reading stones over the text. Of course, you could skip reading stones and go for spectacles or eyeglasses instead. These were invented somewhere in the late 13th century. The earliest evidence of spectacles comes from Italy, specifically in the region around Florence, Pizza and Venice. I mean, it makes sense, right? With Murano right there and all. Early spectacles were of a simple design, consisting of two convex lenses for correcting farsightedness, mounted in frames made of bone, metal, or leather. The frames were either handheld or balanced on the nose, as they lacked the temples or side arms that hooked behind the ears that we have in our modern spectacles. By the 14th and 15th century, the use of spectacles spread across Europe and they became more widely available due to the development of glass making and lens grinding techniques. The invention of the printing press in the mid 15th century led to a vast increase in the availability of books, which in turn increased the demand for spectacles as more people learned to read. By the 18th century, Benjamin Franklin invented bifocals and, well, here we are. My spectacles even correct for astigmatism. So, don't be afraid of history hitting you in the face if you want to have spectacles. You can have spectacles available in a medieval world easily. They'll just be pretty expensive. Right, back to history. Eventually, of course, we figured out how to make glass cheaply through industrial processes. And here we are in the modern era with glass windows, glass carrying our data, glass in our telescopes, glass on our eyes, and the list of glass just goes on. It is really an incredible, versatile material. One of the best we've ever made. So, thumbs up for the history of glass. And let's talk about using glass in fantasy world building. 
Glass can be all kinds of fun, just from a usage standpoint. You can use glass as a flex of wealth in a medieval world where a clear glass pane is, a, is seriously rich and shows how much time people invest in their building. Glass can be used for jewellery, for mirrors, for bottles. You can have eyeglasses, reading glasses, reading stones and all the other bits and bobs that we spoke about. But of course, this is fantasy. So let's take a look at the fantastical attributes. Magical mirrors is a standard. The magical item has been used for everything from communication to scrying. In Harry Potter, we had the mirror of error seed, which showed the deepest desire of the person looking into the mirror. In Snow White, the fairy tale, the evil queen relied on her mirror to keep tab on the fairest of them all. Mirrors, being reflective, can also be used in defensive and illusion magic, where they can be great tools for a mage. Then, of course, there are crystal balls. These mystical orbs are the go-to tool for fortune tellers, wizards, and witches alike. The most famous example in fantasy is probably the Palantir from Lord of the Rings, which can be used to, as a communication device, and, of course, Sauron can see through them by the time we reach the trilogy. But an even more interesting use in glass is weaponry, especially if you have dragons in your world. If you do, you have the potential for dragon glass forged in the breath of a dragon and made super strong because of their magic. You could bind enchantments to glass and create crystal swords, which could be used by psionics or other telepathically minded characters, as I discussed in my video on mental powers. But don't restrict yourself to glass swords and the like. There are some great examples of innovative use of glass as a weapon in fantasy. In Garth Nix's Old Kingdom series, the Abhorsen wields a set of magical bells made from silver and glass that control the dead a hauntingly beautiful fusion of glass and magic. Glass very naturally lends itself to spying as well, first through its natural magnifying properties, but you can increase that further with magic, say by carving ruins onto a spyglass to increase its range. Glass can also play a vital role in magical architecture, like the breathtaking glass city of Elfheim in Holly Black's The Cruel Prince, or the simmering glass towers in Garth Nix's Lyriel, where the fabled Clear reside. I have a glass triangle in my city in Kisangi, which is the home of the Balancer, the high priestess of the goddess, and her husbands, who are essentially a Pope equivalent in terms of power structure on the continent of Kisangi. So glass in these fantasy worlds can be as strong as steel or as flexible as fabric, defying our understanding of this versatile material due to the addition of magic. And lastly, we can't overlook the importance of glass in fantasy fashion. You could have stunning glass jewellery imbued with magical properties, like necklaces that protect the wearer from harm, or glass pendants that can store memories. I use glass to form sewa charms, which the priests of my religion from the Order of the Threesome can use to channel the power of the gods. For normal people, the sewa charms are just glass beads that symbolize prayers. But for the priests with a talent for magic, they are a critical part of using the gods' power. Of course, you are not just restricted to items. You can develop a whole magic system around glass. For example, you could use a runic magic system, but the symbols are cast in glass. So your glass blower is actually literally forging spells as he creates these ruins. Maybe it can even be that anyone can use these spells once the glass blower has forged them which would be a fascinating application of magic. In the Stormlight Archive, Sanderson has a shield that protects a crystal power, which is manufactured via the surge of transformation, where the soul caster convinces the air to believe that it is glass. 
thus using glass's reflective protective properties. So there's definitely a lot of fantasy potential in glass. And those are my thoughts on glass and glass manufacturing in a fantasy world. If you want to support this channel, links to my books down below or use the join button for these cool channel perks. And if you enjoyed this video, do check out my video on spinning in fantasy worlds. And I will see you soon for another episode from Just in Time Worlds.